Richard has been uh, was well, known from uh, the uh, game Ip and Op that you've been working on for a while. You've also demonstrated many prototypes in the past. We've seen you do all sorts of interesting experiments. Um, Richard is going to share with us a bit about his vision on design. Uh, his title of his talk is Dissecting Design Goals, which basically sounds like you're trying to get order into your questions and what you want to achieve, but I will leave that to you. Richard is from Rotterdam and uh, he's just an all-round great guy, so a warm <laughs> applause again for Richard. Um, thanks, Jeppe. Uh, welcome. Uh, I think Jeppe uh, said most of this, but uh, my name is Richard Boozer. I work uh, at Sparkweed, or at Sparkweed. Sparkweed is a two-man studio uh, based in Rotterdam, uh, and I'm half of that. We released our first game uh, in August on PlayStation 3. It's Ipnop. Uh, I won't be talking that much about Ipnop today. Uh, I will touch on it uh, shortly. Uh, instead, I'll talk a lot about vacuum cleaners uh, and about game design. So, uh, I hope you like vacuum cleaners. So, why vacuum cleaners? Uh, I studied industrial design at the Technical University in Delft. Uh, uh, basically, that, that, that study aims at uh, uh, helping you learn to create products, or, or the way they put it, creating products for people. Uh, creating everyday products like vacuum cleaners. Um, so today I want to start off uh, talk a bit about product design because I think there's an interesting link to game design. So how do you design a vacuum cleaner? And uh, some obvious, obvious things you would, uh, would encounter is you, you'll do some market research, uh, you'll look at, uh, at products uh, currently in the market and you look at the problems with existing products like uh, where, do they, uh, where do they fail after a few years. Uh, have a look at new technologies, look at new features you might be able to add uh, to existing products. Uh, well, th this, this is all quite com a quite common way to, to look at design. And then you end up with a new shiny uh, vacuum cleaner, which is maybe a bit cheaper than the previous one. Uh, suction power increased. Uh, it's, it, it's better in, in general. And it has maybe some fancy feature like lights on the nozzle. <laughs> I'm not sure if this is really produced, but it, it'll help you to clean those also dark places in your house. Uh, so, so this is actually, I mean, I, I'm making a bit of fun of this right now, but it, this is quite common, right? If you go to the media marks, most vacuum cleaners look, look alike. Um, but is it, is it really what we wanted? Did, did we ask the right questions to, to get uh, to something that helps us improve our lives? Uh, and I think you can you can dig a bit deeper. I think it's useful to to try and analyze your your problem uh, as far as possible. So so let's ask some questions. Uh, why do we want a vacuum cleaner in the first place? Well, this sounds like a really obvious question, but uh, it also has quite an obvious answer. Uh, we want to get rid of dust in your house. Okay, so it seems to make sense. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so. How can you remove dust from your house? Seems also like a, a, a logical follow-up question. Um, and this is how it typically goes. So, okay, how can you remove dust from your house? Well, you can either suck it up or you could uh, maybe glue it to something or, uh, I don't know, swipe it off. Uh, well, it's quite a technical approach. So instead, maybe we should look at it differently uh, and ask a different question. So how do you want to experience the dust removal? So we're not talking about uh, uh, about the product now, we're talking about the experience. So how would you want dust to be removed from your house? And you you'll might end up with, uh, with different terms. So uh, yeah, you, you might feel that you want to, it to happen effortless or un unnoticeable. Or maybe you want it to be rewarding or fun because it, that's probably not the case right now. Um, and then if you take these starting points, so, so we start at a different position now, and then you try to design something that, that removes the dust in your house in such a way, uh, you might end up with something different. So I'm not saying these are so great, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, on the left you see a, a, a pair of shoes that actually 
convert your walking energy into uh, suction. Um, in the middle you see a vacuum cleaner that holds your MP3 player and it's actually really low noise, that, that uh, machine, so it, it, it plays music instead of uh, engine noise. <laughs> Um, so that's more focused on fun, and uh, and the last one we actually it, it's becoming more common. It's like a robot vacuum cleaner, uh, which actually does your job unnoticeable because it's somewhere in your house. You program it to to do the job. You go to work. Uh, it it vacuums your house. It moves itself back to its uh, uh, its charging station, and when you're back, your house is clean. So. What I'd like to illustrate by this is that by asking a few different questions and trying to start at a different, uh, uh, different point, you might end up with more original concepts. But we might be able to take it a bit further. So uh, why stop asking questions? Uh, so we want to get rid of dust, but why do we want to get rid of the dust? Okay, it's a simple answer again is like it's unhealthy. Uh, so, so let's look at that. Uh, uh, what, what can we conclude? We, we know that people, uh, they, they, want a they want their house to be a healthy environment. That's sort of the experience they want to have. And, and that's a whole different starting point. So now we try to dig towards the, the essence of the problem. And from there we know, okay, so dust, dust is the thing that's in the way of experiencing a healthy uh, household. Uh, so we could could look at that a different way. So what can we do about that? We could either prevent dust from being there in the first place, which doesn't seem, it's, it's, it's difficult, but it's, it's possible maybe. We could alter the public perception on dust uh, or change dust into something more useful uh, or remove it. So the, the typical way we approach it, uh, approach it now. Um, so let's choose uh, to alter the perception on dust. So this is my suggestion. Uh, we do a big marketing campaign. Uh, and I hope you, next time you clean your house, you'll think about this. Because there's thousands of small animals in there. And don't kill them. Um, so obviously this is a bit of a joke. But it's a whole different answer to the question, how do you design a vacuum cleaner, than you might expect at the start. And uh, an important part of that is that uh, I think we should think about the experience. And um, in product design, this is something that's becoming more and more common. It, it wasn't like that before. It was just like, okay, we create new products and we're creating products that will help you solve your problem. Uh, instead, now we, we are asking questions. Uh, what do we want people to experience? So. Uh, but what about games? I mean, we're here for uh, a talk on game design. And to me, it seems really obvious that in games, it's actually uh, far more obvious that we look at the player experience. I mean, every game creates a certain experience when you play it. Um, so so it, it makes total sense that we know what kind of player experience we want to create. But, but do we really know that? And, uh, what I believe is that it's for us it's quite easy for developers it's easy to uh, to forget to pay attention to this actually because if we look at how we select games so this is the the way games are organized in Steam Store and almost similar in a similar way in the, in the PlayStation Store or anywhere else uh, this is what we choose from so we feel like playing a game what uh, what do we choose and um, we, we all know these terms. We know that uh, if, we, if we see the term massive multiplayer, we have some sort of expectation on what kind of experience that will deliver. But does it really say something about the experience? Uh, because I, I think that a, a massive multiplayer game can be something that, that either makes you sad or happy. You don't know that by judging that, uh, that genre name. Or, um, or for that matter, a strategy game could be really relaxing, but it could also be really stressful. So, uh, but we're really used to these terms, and we, we also, uh, well, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this, uh, because I think there, uh, why, why isn't it like this? So why don't we go to Steam, and, uh, and we'll be like, okay, what do I feel like playing? 
uh, I want to be I want to be powerful. I want to play something with uh, large complexity, uh, but also want to be creative. So I choose a few, and in return I get a suggestion to play uh, Reus, for example. Uh, and I'm not saying this is the best way to do this, but uh, we don't have this. And I believe that's a sign of us not focusing on, uh, or not really knowing what the experience is we're creating. So, uh, in line with that, it's not only the stores that talk like this, it's also us. Because we, we also write the text to promote our game. So on the, on the left, you'll see, um, uh, you'll see a description of a game. It's, it's a mashup of two descriptions I found on Steam. Uh, so a voxel-based one to four player co-op arcade action RPG with puzzle and tactical elements. And it's really, well, it's, it's just a mashup of two. Um, so we kind of, we, we can read this, we know what it says, but do, do we know what kind of game experience we're gonna, uh, gonna experience? Uh, and on the other hand, on the right, there was another game description, and part of that description was, uh, it makes you feel like a cat. And I'm like, okay, well, now, now, now it's getting interesting. And uh, I must say, unfortunately, there, there was, a it was only a part of a larger description, and I think it would have been really strong if they just have left it like this. Makes you feel like a cat. I mean, I would kind of like to play that. Um, and personally, I'm not good at this either. If I, if I talk about my game, Ip and Op, uh, often I, I hear myself say, like, yeah, it's a two-player cooperative platform puzzler, and, I'm like, yeah, what does it even mean? And what does it really say about the experience? So, if we, uh, I believe we're quite used to talking in games in, uh, in different ways than really based on the experience it creates. And that makes me wonder, like, do we really know what we're creating? Do we know what kind of experience we want the player to have? Um, so, I'd like to illustrate that uh, with four examples. And a glass of water. Uh, Fingal, I, I think most might know this game. Uh, Fingal by Game Oven. Um, this is what it looks like. So, so what kind of game is this? And on the left, I, I wrote a description that I think uh, is really it's not a good description, but I think it would be quite common to see this kind of uh, uh, text. So, a retro-styled finger-twisting puzzle game for two players. Doesn't sound weird, right? Uh, but instead, what uh, Game Oven uses is the thrills of touching each other's hands. And this is an excellent example of talking about the actual player experience. So it doesn't say anything about whether this is a first-person shooter or a, uh, an iPad uh, finger twister or <laughs> whatever. It says something about uh, the emotions you'll, you'll experience. And you'll see that in their, or one of their trailers as well. So these are stills from uh, one of the Fingal trailers. Uh, there's a fireplace, there's candlelight, there's, uh, uh, there's two intense looking people <laughs> uh, or looking intensely at each other. And they're playing Fingal. But it's really, the game is almost secondary. It's about the experience they're creating. Um, and Fingal is an excellent example for me to uh, talk about uh, player experience as a starting point for your game. Uh, and I don't think this is the only way to do it, but this, it's, it's cool to look at this one, because I think it's a really pure example. So this is Jelly Reef. It's a, a, multi, uh, it's a game for uh, multi-touch tables, I think the Windows tables, Boyan? Uh, Microsoft, Microsoft Surface, I think. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a, it's a game on a, on a huge uh, uh, table where multiple people are interacting on the same surface. And um, while observing people playing this, Adrian Jong, the designer of this game, uh, he noticed like there's Occasionally, there's like this awkward situation where hands are touching of, of maybe of strangers in, in a way they uh, that, that led to some sort of weird interaction. Uh, and there's a certain spark there. Uh, and he noticed it. And he was like, okay, I want to make a game about that. I want to uh, take that part of the experience and I want to emphasize it and I want to enlarge it and make a single game out of that. So, 
wait a minute. <laughs> he added uh, some more ingredients. Uh, yeah, he, he matched it with a bit of flirting and a hint to, uh, to sex and um, had a really good starting point uh, for a game. So, I, I, I'm, I mean, I wrote this text, so I hope he kind of agrees. Oh, yeah, yeah okay, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so, there is some awkward finger touching with a sexual connotation. And um, the cool thing is, you, you can start with this. You can have this player experience in mind and not know what kind of game, or like what, what kind of uh, uh, genre game you'll end up with. Because you could make, I don't know, you could maybe make a first person shooter <laughs> that does something similar, though it will be difficult. Uh, but there's nothing in here that, that, uh, that limits you to what kind of game you create. Uh, and, and from here, he developed it on and on uh, to what we now know as Fingal. And I believe that you, the only way to design Fingal is this way. Because I don't think you'll get here if you base your design decisions on patterns you already know from other games. Okay, so this is one way where you, one game, one example where you clearly see uh, player experience as a starting point. Uh, that's not the only way to do it. Uh, so, Chalo Chalo, a lot less known. <laughs> So this is one of my games. Um, so Chala Chala started uh, in a different way. So it, it started here. Uh, this is me and friends hiking in uh, Portugal. And uh, well, you see us trying to f make our way through well, some low bushes. Not too hard, not too easy either. Uh, so, but, but what are we looking at? So this is the top view of the situation. We were at point A. And we wanted to go to B. And there was a road, uh, which uh, was an easy way to walk, or we would choose to, to go through the bushes. And it's not a really short, uh, it, it, it looks a bit short like this, but the road is not on scale, so it's, it's like one or two kilometers. Uh, so we had two choices. And we honestly didn't know what the quickest way would be. So we chose the adventurous one, and it ended up being quite a hassle because there were thorny bushes all over the place and uh, anyway, but it was th this moment where we had to decide uh, what path to choose um, and it happened to me more often that I thought like, okay, hey, this is an interesting mechanic to base a game on because there's something interesting happening here. Um, but this is not really an experience, this is, this is a mechanic. So, uh, uh, predict the quickest path over different terrains. And uh, I thought, okay, I want to make a game out of that. I want to combine it with some other ingredients. Uh, one of them is that I want to outsmart others because I want to have multiple people judge the same terrain and, uh, and see who can judge best what the, the optimal path is. Uh, but at the same time, I want to reward originality. I want to reward those that find a really unexpected trajectory or unexpected uh, path uh, that ends up being really smart. Uh, and this was where Chala Chala started. I didn't know what kind of game it would be, uh, but, but it sort of made sense to, uh, not that quick, make it into something uh, that ended up being this. So I'll explain what you see here. Um, Chala Chala is uh, now, it's, it is sort of a racing game, though it would never fit the racing category on Steam, I believe. But uh, you're with four players, and you all start on the left of the screen, and your goal is there on the right. It's the circular thing on the right. Or I should point there, maybe. Um, and there's four types of terrain. There's the green uh, stuff, which is really quick. You travel really quick, and it's easy to steer. There's the, the dark areas, which are really slow, but you can go through, but they're super slow. Then there's uh, the sort of gray in between, which is somewhere in between, and then there's the white stuff, which is ice-like, so it's really difficult to steer, uh, but you keep your speed. So if, if you pass through green first and then go onto the ice, you keep your speed, uh, but if you go from black to white, it's uh, a long time accelerating. Um, and this, this works well. It's, uh, the, the levels are procedurally generated, so it's never the same. So uh, what I do is like, the 
players start on the left, they have a few. They, they get to see the level. They have a few seconds to decide what path they're going to take, and then they're off. And it's it's quite slow. They're really moving at a slow pace, and it's only on one screen, so it it takes you, I don't know, ten seconds to go from the left of your screen to the right. So it's it's slow. Uh, but you already notice that people will make different decisions. People will choose different paths. Uh, because they don't know, they ca you can't immediately see what's the, the best way. And then, uh, uh, so one of the things I wanted to do was re uh, reward originality. And the first way of doing that, or the first way we tried doing that, is, uh, is by having players that are far away from other players move faster. So if you're with four players and three of them stick together, and one chooses to be original, <laughs> Uh, the one on its own would be faster, but he would probably probably choose uh, a path that looks less quick. So it, it's sort of a yeah, it's it's a balance between uh, the, the the optimum solution. Uh, we tried this; it didn't really work. Was a bit too vague, and instead we ended up having all kinds of different um, add-ons. So each level or each race, uh, you get to choose one power-up that you can use only once. And they really uh, change the way people play. So some of them uh, make it useful to stay together. Others uh, make it really beneficial to choose your own path. So OK, so this is Cello Cello. Um, so here, it didn't start with the player experience immediately. I found a mechanic that I wanted to explore. And I, then I found other uh, experience ingredients <laughs> that would fit this. And then it slowly iterated into uh, what it is today. So Ip and Op is again a different story. So Ip and Op is the game we released uh, on PlayStation 3. Um, I don't know how many people played that, but somehow, yeah, <laughs> at least some played. Thanks. Um, so. So what about Ip and Op? That started out differently. I, I knew uh, I had set some project outlines. I, I knew I wanted to create uh, certain things. I wanted to work on an original core mechanic. And I wanted to involve multiple players. And I knew I wanted a game that is, uh, was accessible, both in controls and in, in the amount of rules and complexity. Um, but I really had no idea what kind of game that would, this would end up with. So I tried out all kinds of different things. I built all kinds of prototypes, ranging from uh, 3D top view stuff to, uh, to uh, well, <laughs> more like platformer things. And ended up with the first idea about the double gravity. And uh, so in Ibn Op, the world is always split in two. In the top half, gravity is normal. And in the bottom half, gravity is reversed. And this idea uh, seemed, again, this is a mechanic. I like to start with mechanics. And, um, and this seemed to connect really well to uh, two players cooperating. I hadn't, I hadn't said that before. I, I didn't know that I wanted to create a two-player cooperative game. But it just uh, seemed really natural to do it like that. So I had the idea where uh, if one of the players would bounce on the floor, uh, the other one would get its energy and, and leap upwards. And that's, in the end game, it's still there, but it's not as crucial, crucial as it was in the first idea. But from there, it, um, uh, it sort of evolved into uh, a new idea for what kind of experience I wanted to create. So what I knew is that this is what I wanted to focus on, working together in a harmonious flow. So it's really about cooperation, and it's really about... Um, paying attention to the other player and really being in this flow together. So um, that's at least what I was, uh, what I thought I was creating. And then uh, I built levels and we played. And uh, one of the mechanics in the game is the way you take out enemies. Uh, so so each enemy uh, has a white counterpart, and if you touch the white part. Uh, the black part ex uh, explodes, and uh, and you defeat the enemy. It's, it's super simple. And the way I tested it, and I tested it also on my own, which is not the best way to test a two-player game, but uh, so when I was testing it, um, it felt a bit like this. Like one player would uh, take out the first enemy, the other one would take another, uh, the second one on the other side of the split, and and so on and so on. And it felt really like okay, we're we're doing this together, and really cool. 
And, and this is, so this graph sort of envisions the, the feeling I thought it, it would give players. And instead, they played like this. So player one would be on the left side of the screen, trying to jump on some sort of ledge that had absolutely no uh, functional meaning. Uh, while well, the other player was trying to figure out how, uh, how to take out an enemy on the right side of the screen. Um, and I really, I, I was totally surprised seeing people do it like this. And, and I realized it, it totally broke uh, the player experience that I was after. So, um, we changed the mechanics of the way uh, enemies uh, work. Or we added something to that. So, right now, Enemies still explode when you touch their white counterpart. But along with the explosion, there's some sort of crystal that sprouts from the dead body and uh, flies up in the air and uh, well, drops down quite quickly again. And uh, you want to collect those. Um, why you want to collect those is a different story, but you want to collect those. And the interesting thing is that even without telling people that they should collect these, these crystals, it immediately worked because the crystal, uh, when it drops on the floor, it'll it'll uh, separate into a few smaller crystals and they'll uh, they'll bounce around three or four times and then they're gone. So you have to be uh, you have to be be there quite quick, and you can't really do that on your own. So if you take out the enemy, uh, you could like you, you could oh wait sorry different game uh, you could walk around and, and collect your reward. But that's not the efficient way to do it. And immediately when this, this was in, people started to pay attention to the other player. And that was the, the crucial missing link, I'd say. As soon as they start doing that, they, like 50% of the time, they're watching the other player. And this was exactly what I wanted. Now they were really, really playing together. Okay, so they, with this, I, I want to illustrate that sometimes um, working towards that player experience is a matter of optimizing your mechanics or adding things uh, uh, to get there. And, um, but I believe you can only do this if you understand what experience you, you want to create. If you have no idea, you just continue building the game. And it's quite easy to do so because we all know platform games. So we, we build on those patterns that we know. And we, you can make a whole game without really realizing uh, what experience you're after. Okay, so the last game I'd like to uh, uh, talk a bit about is uh, Burnout 3 Takedown by Criterion Games. So a really different game. I thought it would be nice to show it's not only sort of applicable to indie games. Um, so obviously this is a racing game. I think the guys starting, starting to design this, they, they knew they wanted to create a racing game. But, uh, but then there's, again, there's a, a simple question to ask yourself. What do you like about racing games? And I, I believe that, uh, I mean, there's, there's obviously there's plenty of different answers to this. So it could be that you're just really into cars. Uh, or you like the sensation of speed. Or you, you like the, the control it gives you or the competition. And um, no matter what the answer is to this question, I think that if you're designing such a game, you should be able to answer this. You, you should try and dig deeper into into racing games and understand the fundamentals of what you, what do you really enjoy about these kind of games? So, I believe, but this, I mean, I haven't checked this with those guys, but I think this is what they're after with Burnout. Uh, it's about continuously uh, being on and over the edge of losing control. Uh, and, I mean, it's not about choosing the perfect, uh, perfect corners. It's about this. It's about your all always almost crashing. So if you, this is how I think the game works. You're driving at insane speeds, and if you're not doing that, you're crashing, and then immediately after that, you're driving at insane speeds. And this is, um, it seems rather ridiculous, but it's, it's, it's perfect, perfect in line with that player experience. And, um, and even so, that it, like the moments that you crash, it's like, okay, you get like, one or two, I don't know, maybe three seconds of uh, relief, like, okay, you can watch this beautiful, spectacular crash, and then you're put back in the game at full speed again, and so you're on the edge immediately. And, uh, and as, as if that's not enough, they add some mechanics that make it even well, worse or in more intense, let's put it like that. 
Um, so to win a race, you probably need boost. Boost is what you use to, to turbo, to go really fast. Um, so how do you get boost? Uh, so you get boost as a reward for taking risks. That means that if you go up against upcoming traf uh, traffic, or you choose to drift through a corner, or you pass by other cars really closely, you get some boost. And uh, so, so what happens is that any moment in the game where you feel you're slightly comfortable, uh, you notice that you yourself have to push yourself again to, to that edge, because you know, okay, then I'll, I'll take some risk because I need to boost. So there's never a moment to relax, and if there is, <laughs> uh, it's up to you to, to go to that edge again, because they'll reward it. And then the reward is boost, and using the boost is actually insane again, because you already thought you were driving really fast, but using the boost uh, is almost always over the edge. So all of this adds to that, that first experience. And I think that uh, having a clear vision on what your game is, is trying to achieve helps you make these kind of decisions, helps you uh, make sure that you don't have a pit stop strategy in, in burnout, because it doesn't match that, uh, that experience. So, um, how to conclude this? Uh, this is not a story about uh, a certain methodology, it's, it's just a story about uh, player experience. And it's something that it's every game uh, creates. And it's something that is really easy to not pay attention to. Because we all know uh, many different games, and we can easily make a whole game just based on, on things we know from other games, without realizing, uh, but what exactly am I trying to do? Um, and I believe there's different strategies to, to help you in this. And one is to try to really dissect your game ideas. Uh, so really uh, look at all the parts of your game and try to see how those add to a certain experience. And, uh, and dig deeper, ask yourself those questions. Like, okay, you, li you, like, uh, you want to create a game about fear or you want to scare people. Um, so what is fear? L like really try to dig deeper. And fear is not like being afraid of, of aliens. Fear is uh, caused by uh, feeling that you might lose something that is important to you. And when you go deeper and deeper, you might end up with a whole different game that you, than you expected, uh, but one that uh, suits the experience a lot better. Uh, so one part of this is about digging deeper. And the other part of, of this is just a simple thing, like ask yourself the question, what is my game trying to achieve? What player experience am I after? And uh, uh, you can ask that anywhere in your process. So, what I suggest, what I think is a really nice thing to do, is that every now and then, you take half a day, uh, you choose a nice place, either in a park or in a cafe, uh, and bring a notebook, and start asking yourself these questions. Like, look at your game, and, um, and ask, like, okay, there's levels in my game. Why are there levels in my game? What, how do these... How does the system of having levels uh, contribute to the game experience or the player experience? Uh, I have lives in my game. Why are they there? And try to dig deeper and analyze this and answer the question, what is the player experience that I'm after? Um, so I want to I wanna leave it uh, uh, like this with a nice view. Um, yeah, if you, if you want to uh, contact me, you can send me emails or hook up on Twitter. And uh, I think it's time for questions. Thank you so much, uh, Richard. But uh, before the email, you can actually ask you questions now. So anybody here? Are you all flabbergasted by this? Jan Willem, do you have any? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really good, actually, no, I think. I <laughs> Uh, yeah, you say that uh, experience is uh, really important, and yet you seem to start out with mechanics at first. Mm -hmm. So, is there a reason for doing that? Um, it's it's just the way that 
I really like to work. Um, but I, I, I wanted to show that because there's, I think there's different ways to approach this. And for example, the way that um, that game often did in Fingal, but also now with a friend strip, a friend strap, is is quite purist in this, where they really start out with uh, imagining a player experience. And, um, and that's one approach. I mean, you can sit down and, and try to write down, like, okay, what do I really want people to experience? Uh, and, and I think that's a really interesting approach. But, um, but at the same time, Fingal would have never been there if there were no Jelly Reef. So in a way, Jelly Reef was a... Uh, was a or there, there was a step before where you, you looked at a game, uh, a working system, and you noticed that there's some sort of interaction going on that leads to an interesting experience. And I kind of like that, that approach. So I kind of like to start with mechanics that I find interesting and original, and then when those start working, and you see the way players interact with that and the, the kind of experience they get from that, uh, then I, I, I think that's the moment that I go into, like, go deeper into that experience and try to really, really understand what's uh, going on. And I, I think that's a personal preference. I think you can do it anywhere in the, in your game development process. And it just, yeah, depends on what kind of uh, person you are, I guess. It sounds like you're also really talking about what kind of questions am I going to ask myself while I'm experimenting, is what you're saying. Really. Yeah, yeah, because I think it's, um, and that's, that's just typically because we know so many games that it's so easy to, uh, to end up in, in existing patterns. And there's nothing wrong with that, in a way. Ipnop has plenty of patterns we know from other games. I mean, it's a plat platform game. You can go left, right, you, you jump. It has levels, though it's a bit different than in most. Um, but still, you, you can do that and, and still ask those questions. And just ask yourself, look, okay, why is there jumping in this game? What does it really contribute to that experience? And it, it seems a bit annoying. It seems almost like a small kid being like, oh, why is this? And why is that? Why is that? But it, it only takes you like half a day and be really annoying to, to yourself and ask those questions. Mm. And if you, if you can't answer them, that might uh, be a lead to, to look at why you can't answer them and try to, to find an answer in a different way. Yeah. Anyone else here? Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you were um, talking about categories and, and how those weren't about emotions. And I was wondering um, if, if you think those should be changed, and if so, what you would do about um, emotions that would be um, spoiled by knowing the emotion up front. Because, for example, Fingal, when I, when I read that, I was thinking, well, this is Barney Stinson's teacup pig. It's, it's an excuse to do something that's sexually, yeah. and and if you know that up front, that could kind of hey, let's play this game that will get us going. That that doesn't really work. Yeah, no, that is absolutely uh, true. Uh, so, um, I, I'm not sure. I I don't really think the, the categories that exist right now should change. Uh, I think they're they're sort of useful to most of us because we kind of know what to expect from those, but. It does show that um, that I mean, if you if you're gonna watch a movie, you, you choose maybe thriller or you watch comedy. Uh, you can't cho choose comedy as a category in any store that I know for games, uh, or, or despair or uh, fear or well, fear maybe with horror uh, nowadays. But uh, so I think it it could be. Uh, broadened in that way, or it could be a separate system where you choose based on experience or emotional experience instead of uh, the, the existing categories we know. Um, but yeah, your other question, wouldn't you spoil uh, something? Uh, yeah, you would definitely spoil something, um, but that, that's going to be a difficult question anyway, because the, the nicest way to play Fingal is that you know nothing about the game and somebody puts this iPad on your table and you happen to sit next to someone that you find kind of interesting or attractive and you start playing Fingal, right? That, that would be a perfect setup. But um, uh, that could still happen if, if in some store there was a different uh, category. Um, uh, but it's, it, yeah, that depends so much on, on the situation. Um, and in a way you'd, yeah, I don't know, you, you could, you would, spoil something in some games, but 
I don't know. I, I don't know if that's worse than having Fingal in the puzzle uh, category. Right? I, yeah, I don't know about that. I, I would find that weird. Like, oh, I want to play a puzzle, and then it's Fingal. It's like, okay. It would be cool if you would be, yeah, if it just happened to be the right situation. But I don't know. D difficult, difficult. Another question? Um, do you think that whole genre thing is maybe because games cost money and people want to compare them to things they've paid money for before? And uh, because like Netflix, where you pay once a month and you get a ton of movie, that stuff is sort of like um, horror movies for children about fish. Like <laughs> uh, that's yeah. pretty much how it works. And do you think that with stuff like uh, PlayStation Plus, where you actually get a lot of games every month, descriptions like this game makes you feel like a cat will also work way better than saying a uh, roguelike game with blah 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 blah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess people have the game anyway and they're like, well, I yeah, don't yeah, care yeah, what true. it is, I yeah. just want to be a cat now yeah. and it doesn't cost me money. Yeah, yeah it's, it's um, I mean, uh, working on this presentation was the first time that I, that I really thought about those uh, stores because I was actually looking at Netflix and then I realized like, oh, these categories are quite different than the ones we have in, in game stores. Um, I mean, they're not totally different, but they're quite different. And um, so, so I have no sort of crystallized idea on this. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it is definitely true that you, people feel that they need to compare these games because one game is like 60 euros and the other is two. And, um, but then again, I, I guess that in the current genres, they're not all labeled the same price, right? So could be quite different still, like, I guess, yeah. I don't know. It, it, it would be nice to try it. Like, put your game in one store with, like, a really descriptive thing about the mechanics of the game, and, uh, and in another store, just write, like, you, you're a cat, and see what, what happens. I don't know. Maybe I could try. Yeah, question. Aren't you afraid that when you start uh, categorizing games in experiences or emotions that you are actually trying to say something that might not be true for the person actually playing. Like I'm putting out a dark horror game and the, the guy playing goes like, oh, I've seen worse. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so two sides to that story. I, th I think the, the way I showed it now was mostly to illustrate that I think we're quite used to talk about games uh, not in this way. Um, and then also looking at how a system like that would work, I think it would be kind of nice that there would be at first, there would be a, a fixed amount of labels, like in experiential labels that you could tag to a game, but uh, only players would be allowed to do so, I think. Uh, so uh, players could label, uh, well, like Reus, they could label it like a creative, complex, powerful, or something like that. And then uh, that would be an additional filter for you to, to go through the whole games catalog. Um, I think, yeah, it would be weird. It, it, yeah, I think if the developer themselves choose to do so, it, it might not be accurate at all. I think that would be something for the players. Don't know if it works. Would be nice to try. Anyone? Anyone? Yes, Derek. Actually, in Little Big Planet, they have that for the player created levels. And you, you, the players can actually tag the levels that they play. Uh, with tags like uh, fun or creative or okay. awesome or whatever tag they choose, so and that works pretty well. Yeah, so. it sounds. Yeah, it sounds that it makes sense. I mean, so I'm not original in that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any more questions? Yep. Um, do you ever worry that your uh, core player experience is um, is too small? So like or too broad actually. So for example, your player experience is fear mm. because that's really broad and you can yeah. do a lot of things with that. Yeah. I, I, I think that if you start off like that, like oh, I want to create fear, that's, that's super broad. Uh, but in a way you could start off with that and try to explore that. And when you're doing so, uh, you, you can always refine that, that player experience. It doesn't have to be a fixed thing. I mean, it can also change depending on, on your, uh, your prototypes or the findings uh, during development. So uh, I'd imagine that if you start off with something like fear, uh, it might become a more nuanced 
uh, thing, I don't know, um, <laughs> relaxing fear, or uh, I don't know, something really weird, uh, but with more, yeah, with more specific nuances. But I don't know, I think you could start out like that and then just uh, keep your eyes open and make sure that you, that you make it more focused during development. Anybody else? Well, thanks, uh, Richard. I have a question. When is your next game coming out, and what is it? Tell us exactly. I don't know. <laughs> um, Are you already working on prototypes? Right now, we're doing uh, the the Steam version of Ip and Op, yeah. and that's uh, that's really uh, my priority now. Yeah. When's that gonna? When are you trying to get that done? It's uh, it's uh, not gonna be done in the first quarter of the next year. I see. Okay. So somewhere after that. Somewhere and after. That. I mean, I've been notoriously bad at predicting release rate uh, release dates so, so on, far. On time so for uh, on time for the summer sale. Uh, maybe too close to the summer sale. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know really. We're, because we we are actually we're starting the beta somewhere in the next few weeks. Yeah. And it really depends on what what we what what the results of that yeah. are. If it like fills on all kinds of different machines. And will uh, people be able to co-op uh, online? Yes. Yes. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. You you can with the PlayStation version. Oh, that's right. And, but did, actually, we're optimizing that, so it will yeah. be a lot faster. And, uh, and it'll be the first time for you to release anything on Steam. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So we should all focus on that for the next for the second quarter. Yeah, I think so. At least. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Congratulations. And uh, thanks. Well, while Richard is cleaning up, and well, I guess your presentation, your stuff is upstairs, right? Yeah. Then we are. Uh, we have a short break now, uh, about ten minutes, twelve minutes, and then we have our last talk here, which will be for everybody.